Okay, welcome um, to our uh, second lecture of week, week three of Psych 101, General Psychology. Um, on Monday, we talked about, uh, well, we started talking about biological psychology and we mostly talked about basically neurons and how they work. And uh, remember I said that neurons uh, do one of two things. Um, in reality, they just do one of two things. They uh, can send signals or not send signals. Uh, you can turn them on or off. Um, but we also talked about neurotransmitters and the fact that they can affect appetite and sleepiness and memory and mood and all kinds of things. So how do we go from having neurons that basically just turn on and off to affecting things like mood and appetite and learning and all these bunch of things, okay? Because neurotransmitters are the way the, the neurons communicate. They flow across from one neuron to the other. So how does that happen, okay? Well, it, it has to do with the nervous system. See, the neurons are communicating with one another and the signals are sent up and down the body, okay? But that whole system, that whole collection of nerves uh, that communicate uh, throughout your body is called the nervous system. And what determines what function you get, whether it's memory, uh, whether, it, whether mood is affected, whether it's appetite or sleep, uh, depends on where in the nervous system the action is, is taking place. So what is being activated? What part of the brain? So we're gonna mostly talk about the brain today, but the nervous system is the whole collection of nerves from, that runs from your brain to the outer extensions of the body. So the nervous system has two parts. There is the central nervous system, which is the system of nerves from uh, you know, the brain to the spinal cord. So your brain, and then the connections that go down the spinal cord, there are nerves that run between your spinal cord. That is uh, called the central nervous system, the brain and spinal cord. And then there's the peripheral nervous system. From the spinal cord outward to the rest of the body, there's also a bunch of nerves, a bunch of neurons that form connections and networks and chains. Uh, that part is called the peripheral nervous system, the PNS. Central nervous system is CNS, that's the brain and spinal cord, and the peripheral nervous system is the PNS. That's from the spinal cord out to the outer parts of the body, to the other parts of the body. Okay, let's keep going. Here's um, a, um, I guess a flow chart for you guys uh, that shows you the divisions of the nervous system. <clears throat> so you can see uh, we have the nervous system, which is the system of nerves, basically uh, that run throughout the body, including the brain, okay? Where these neurons basically uh, connect and communicate and, uh, and also process information that happens more in the brain. Okay, so the nervous system is divided into the peripheral nervous system, which is the connections from the spinal cord to the rest of the body, and then the central nervous system, the brain to the spinal cord. So I should have said it in reverse. Okay, central nervous system first, from the brain to the spinal cord, that's the central nervous system, and then from the spinal cord outward, that's the peripheral nervous system. So you can see the peripheral nervous system is in red there on the left, it's the connections, from the spinal cord to the outer parts of the body, to the other parts of the body, I should say. Okay, that, what you're seeing there in red, those are, uh, those are not, you know, veins and capillaries. It's not ribs, you know, in the chest area that look like ribs. Um, that's the connection of uh, the nerves, of the nervous system, basically, the map of the nervous system. Okay, um, you can further divide the peripheral nervous system into the autonomic and somatic nervous system. Uh, that we'll talk about later. The autonomic nervous system controls things that are basically supposed to more or less function on, on their own, but you'll learn that you do have some control over that. And then somatic nervous system, which has to do with basically uh, the control of movement in the muscles, uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, that part of it. We'll mention a little bit about that as well. And then the uh, autonomic nervous system can be further divided into the sympathetic and parasympathetic division and we'll talk about what those do. But the sympathetic is arousing, functions in times of emergencies, and the parasympathetic uh, division of the parasympathetic nervous system is calming and functions during non-emergencies. So we'll talk about these. It's just a flow chart that describes everything we're gonna talk about. 
But, um, you know, we're going to spend a lot of time on the brain, okay, and less on just the other uh, parts of the nervous system. Uh, here's more of uh, the same thing, just talking about the divisions of the nervous system. Again, the central nervous system includes the brain and spinal cord. And uh, basically, it says there that the central nervous system is the body's decision maker. So decisions are made starting, you know, they start at the brain and then the information flows downward via the spinal cord. That's the central nervous system. Okay. And you can see there Wood, Wood and Boy, 2008. You know, I'm citing there a textbook where, you know, this information is coming from. Okay, just to remind you about how to cite things in APA style. Uh, and then the peripheral nervous system gathers information from the body and sends, uh, you know, the central nervous uh, system decisions out to the body. Uh, let me explain that a little bit more. Basically, the peripheral nervous system gathers information, okay? That information is sent to the central nervous system and then back, and then information is sent back down to the body. So, so it's basically the central nervous system communicating with the other parts of the body. I've said the same thing like three different times. Uh, know what these things are called, then know what they include. Okay, uh, here's a little bit more uh, about this. Um, the central nervous system, so the central nervous system uh, includes the brain and spinal cord. We said, we said that, that's the fourth time I said it. But now just a little bit of information there. Uh, the brain, as you already know, is, uh, is uh, composed of two hemispheres. There's two hemispheres, two halves of the brain. And they are connected by something called the corpus uh, callosum, which is that bridge. You can see there on the image, there is that bridge between the two hemispheres. That's a bundle of nerves, okay? Uh, it's like a bridge that allows the two halves of the brain to communicate with one another. Because the brain actually uh, works in some kind of uh, interesting ways. For instance, um, the left side of your brain controls the right side, of the right side of the body. When it comes to movement, the left side of the brain controls the movement of the left side of the body. And the right side of the brain, no, the left side of the brain controls the movement of the right side of the body. And the right side of the brain controls the movement of the left side of the body. So, they, so the signals crisscross, okay? And uh, movement, uh, vision, uh, things like that are what we, you know, they, um, you know, they basically, the part of the brain that, that controls those things uh, is actually the opposite side of the body, uh, the opposite side of the brain. So the left side controls the right side of the body and the right side of the brain controls the left side of the body. Okay, don't mean to confuse you guys there. I'm probably saying a little bit too much about this. Um, but there's two halves of the brain uh, that allow the, uh, basically the, 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 there's two halves of the brain and they're, they're connected by the corpus callosum and that allows the two sides of the brain to communicate with one another for the signals to be sent back and forth. Just wanna say something interesting now, uh, believe it or not, um, when there is a seizure, when you have a seizure, if, you, if you've had those, uh, what's happening is that signals are being sent all over the brain uh, uncontrollably. And the person, if it's a big seizure, what we call a grand mal seizure, the person will lose control and they will start, uh, uh, you know, basically, their body will start shaking, they'll fall to the floor, uh, they won't be able to control what they're saying, so they might be stuck on the last word and repeat it over and over. But it's like an electrical storm in the brain. Now, in order to treat these individuals, what they did in the past is they would cut, um, you know, basically the corpus callosum. So essentially cutting the brain in half. And then that would greatly control the seizures because if a seizure started off in one side of the brain, it couldn't spread to the other side. They don't do that anymore to treat epilepsy. Uh, luckily, nowadays, uh, you know, they have medication. Okay, so they don't have to do that. And as you can imagine, when you cut the brain in half via the corpus callosum, it's going to cause problems. Okay, because it turns out that language, things like language and movement, things like that are lateralized, which means they're either on one side of the brain uh, or the other. Okay. <clears throat> So weird things would happen when you cut the brain in half. Um, the participants, I, you know, or the person's IQ would remain roughly the same, but someone could be, uh, you know, touching something, let's say, with their right hand, and they would know what it is by touching it, but they couldn't say what it was because the two halves of the brain are not communicating, and and language 
which is the part that allows you to say what something is, is actually on, you know, it's actually on the left side of the brain. So the two halves need to be able to communicate, you know, uh, because uh, we think of things as if they're in isolation, but uh, movement, uh, vision, language, all these brain areas, all these different brain areas communicate with one another. Okay, so weird things can happen when you cut the brain in half and the two sides of the brain can't communicate. Like you can know what something is by touching it, but you can't say what it is. Or you can say what something is, but you don't recognize it when you touch it. Weird things like that can happen. Anyway, I've said too much about that. So we'll speak a lot about the brain and different brain areas soon. That is what we'll spend most of our time on. But we also have the spinal cord. That's also part of the central nervous system. Um, we won't say too much about the spinal cord other than it's uh, basically like an information highway. It is like a road um, that basically carries signals from the brain to the rest of the body and from the body to the brain. Just like a two-way highway, okay? So the spinal cord transmits messages from the brain to the body and vice versa, from the body to the brain. And it's also involved in reflexes. You know, like when you go to the doctor and the doctor hits your knee with that little rubber hammer and your leg kicks, that is the spinal cord that's involved with that, that's responsible for that. Or the withdrawal reflex, where you touch something and it feels kind of weird and you move your hand right away, that's the spinal cord. It's also involved with pain. Um, you know, uh, if the signals, if the pain signal, let's say you get some kind of injury, let's say in a certain part of your body, well, the signals will travel up the spinal cord and eventually to the brain that understands pain. But without the spinal cord, the pain signals don't get to the brain and therefore you feel nothing. So you can actually become paralyzed if your brain cannot communicate with the rest of the body. You won't have sensation where there's a disruption um, and, uh, and well, you won't feel pain. So I'll put it to you this way. Okay, so let's say uh, you, uh, you break your neck basically and you disrupt, first of all, when you break your neck, you can die by the way. But if you're lucky enough and you live, what will often happen is you'll be paralyzed from the neck down, which means you will feel nothing from the neck down and you won't be able to move from the neck down. And you'll be called a quadriplegic. You can't move your arms or your legs. But if you should break your back, your, your lower back, then your brain cannot communicate with the rest of your body basically from you know, the lower back downward. So you're called a paraplegic, you can't move your legs. You can't feel with your legs, you can't move them because the connection's been disrupted. They are working on ways, the uh, uh, you know, scientists out there, medical researchers on, on ways to reconnect those things and, you know, and provide uh, mobility and sensation to people who have had the, you know, that happen to them. But, the but to make the point here is that the spinal cord is very important. Okay, without it, the information doesn't flow to the rest of the body and the body cannot communicate with the brain. Okay, but I've said too much about that. I spent way too much time on, on that slide than I should have. Um, okay, here's some uh, more information here. And this is just organization. A lot of this chapter is organization. Um, so we, taught, we said the central nervous system is, is composed of the peripheral nervous system. And the, not that, I mean, the nervous system is composed of the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. And the central nervous system is composed of the brain and spinal cord. And then the brain, we further break it up into the forebrain, midbrain, and hindbrain. Okay, the forebrain is the area really that, it's most of the brain that you actually see. It's the area at the top, four means like forward, at the front. It's not just the front, it's the whole area at the top that you see. It's most of the brain. The midbrain is in the middle, you can't really see it. Um, you know, they've kind of made a hole there so you can see the midbrain, you don't really see it. And then the hindbrain is toward the back. But if you think about the brain and how it looks, it's more toward the bottom where it connects with the spinal cord. So it's just organization, no, uh, organization here, okay? The brain is composed of the forebrain, midbrain, and hindbrain. And we will talk about this, these three different regions and what structures are contained in each and what they do. We'll eventually get to the structures and function. And then the forebrain, the biggest part of the brain, we can further break that down into the cerebral cortex, the limbic system, thalamus, and hypothalamus. And we're gonna talk about each of those things and what they do. So that's the forebrain. And, we for, and then now I said we're gonna break that down further. Okay, uh, the cerebral cortex, which is part of the forebrain, is the wrinkled surface of the forebrain. When you look at a brain and you see that 
part uh, at the you know the, the surface of it that looks all wrinkly that is the cerebral cortex okay um cortex i believe just means brain no no cerebral i think means has to do with the brain and cortex means that it's wrinkled it literally means wrinkled brain okay it's the part that looks wrinkled and the cerebral cortex contains uh, these areas of the brain it contains four regions that we need to talk about four areas um so the frontal lobe which is the front part of the brain i'll show you another image in a moment uh, the frontal lobe is the front part of that wrinkled part of the brain uh, and it contains the prefrontal cortex primary motor cortex and Broca's there those are three important parts that i want you to know about now the prefrontal cortex pre means before before the front so the very front part of your brain like right behind your forehead, that wrinkled part there and, a little, and going up a little bit, that's the part of the brain that allows you to have self-control. It allows you to control yourself. Like let's say you get upset and you wanna lash out and you wanna beat somebody up. You decide not to because it would be a very bad thing for you to do. That is the prefrontal cortex that allowed you to do that. It is, it is involved in self-control. It's also involved in attention. You decide that you're gonna pay attention, let's say to the lecture rather than you know your siblings that are running around or your spouse or whoever happens to be there in the room with you as we're having these zoom meetings right uh you decide to focus on certain things to attend to certain things that's the prefrontal cortex so it allows you to decide what to look at to focus on certain things and ignore others also allows you to plan you know to determine that you need to do certain things in a certain order you know that may be first uh, you have to, you know, get up and get ready and then you have to attend your Zoom meetings for class and after a certain time, uh, let's say maybe you have to go to work and then you have to come back and you have to do other things and, and you have like a plan, right? That's the prefrontal cortex. And of course, plans can be very complex. You can also use a plan when you're solving a math problem and things like that. Um, but it's involved in planning and it's also involved in self-awareness. The fact that you know that you're alive and breathing right? You know that you exist is because of the prefrontal cortex. So the prefrontal cortex is really that part of the brain that allows us to separate ourselves really from other animals, to control ourselves, to focus on certain things and others, to plan and do things intelligently, and to be self-aware, to know that we exist and we're alive and know who we are, right? A lot of animals, believe it or not, do not have self-awareness. Your dog, your cat do not have self-awareness. They don't recognize themselves when they look at themselves in the mirror. Uh, they don't understand that that is them looking back. You know, they don't have that self-awareness. Some animals do. Chimpanzees are advanced enough that they do have self-awareness. But that is the prefrontal cortex. A way to think about it is, is, uh, is this. Uh, think of the prefrontal cortex uh, like the executive part of the brain that makes decisions, that are, decides what to focus on, you know, um, controls things. Um, like if you were a, a, a tall building, let's say, at the top, right, um you at the very front of that top of that building you have basically the office there of the executive that looks out over the world right and makes the decisions and decides uh, you know what's going to happen what we're going to focus on how we're going to do things and is aware of everything else that's going on the executive right the ceo of the company right at the very top right in the front that front office building right at the top that's the prefrontal cortex the executive part of the brain and then we have the primary motor cortex. It's also part of the frontal lobe. It's also part of that front part of the brain. It's almost like, it's almost like a front half of the brain, okay? The primary motor cortex controls movement. It's where the decisions about movement are made, okay? Like when you decide that you're gonna walk toward the door and you're gonna open it, the decisions are made in the primary motor cortex. And then it communicates via neurons to the muscles in your body so that you can walk over there, open that door and maybe walk out. Primary just means most important. Cortex just means, you know, brain, okay? Motor means movement. So it's, it's the area of the brain that's most important for movement, is the main part of the brain for movement. There's other parts of the brain that also have to do with movement, but control of movement happens at the primary motor cortex. And then the frontal lobe also contains Broca's area, which is involved with speech production. So the fact that you can talk and produce speech is because of Broca's area, named after someone who discovered, I think his name was Paul Broca. Um, but it has to do with the mechanics of speech. 
you know, for you to move your vocal cords, your tongue, your lips, your jaw in a coordinated way so that you can actually make this, these speech sounds, that is because of Broca's area. If you damage Broca's area, you will not be able to talk. You won't be able to produce speech. I guess I should also say that if you damage the motor cortex, uh, then movement will be impaired. Like for instance, uh, give you a, a real world example here. Uh, if you have actually damage to the right side of the motor cortex, you'll have problems with movement on the left side of your body. And if you damage the left side of the motor, the left, the left side of the motor cortex on the left side of the brain, you'll have trouble controlling the right side of the body. And that is precisely uh, what is happening with those that have something called cerebral cortex. And if you've seen these individuals, they have, um, they have problems with movement. They have trouble moving their arms in a coordinated way, uh, walking, um, you know, um, they, uh, they have a lot of problems with movement. And some of them, some of them have more severe problems than others. It, it depends on the extent of the damage uh, in the brain. But the motor cortex controls movement. That's, that's where the decisions about movement are made. And if it's, if it's um, you know, damaged in some way, then movement will be affected. Okay, there's another part of the cerebral cortex called the parietal lobe. The parietal lobe, all I need you to know about that is that it contains the primary somatosensory cortex. Primary means it's the most important part. Cortex means, you know, um, brain. Okay, so somatosensory, um, cortex just means wrinkled brain. Okay, somatosensory basically means that this is the part of the brain that has to do with your somatal senses. Now that sounds weird. You probably don't know what that is, but look at the things that are involved here. Touch, pressure, vibration, pain, temperature, all those are involved with the somatosensory cortex. And all of those things actually involve your sense of touch. So your somatosensory cortex has to do with the sense of touch. When you touch something and you know that it's rough, it is because of that part of the brain. That is where the information is processed. And it tells you, oh, that is rough or that is sharp. Or, or if you press down on something or someone squeezes your arm, with a lot of pressure. That's the part of the brain that understands that. When you feel vibrations, let's say because someone's playing really loud music next door or maybe in the next room, that's the primary somatosensory cortex that, understand, that understands that, that lets you feel that vibration, okay? You, if you understand that you're in pain, a certain part of your body hurts, that is the part that understands brain, I mean, that understands pain or temperature, right? You know that it's hot, it's cold, it's because of that part of the brain. So this, this is really the part of the brain, uh, the primary somatosensory cortex that understands what's happening uh, with touch and touch is involved with a lot of different things. And that's all I need you to know about the parietal lobe. It contains that area that's important for touch. The cerebral cortex also contains the temporal lobe, number three there. And the temporal lobe, there's two important things I need you to know about it. The temporal lobe contains um, an area called the primary auditory cortex. Remember, primary just means mo most important and cortex means that it has to do with the brain or the wrinkled part of the brain. Auditory means it has to do with sound. So that is the part of the brain that understands what you hear. It has to do with hearing. So if you hear a train in the distance, you recognize that as being a train, right? That is because of the auditory cortex. You hear a dog barking in the distance. You understand that it's a dog barking. That's the auditory cortex. The temporal lobe also contains something called Wernicke's area, which is involved in speech comprehension not speech production, that's Broca's area. Wernicke's area allows you to understand speech. So it's speech comprehension. If you damage Wernicke's area, you will still be able to speak. The problem is that you won't make any sense because you've lost your ability to understand language. So you'll talk and you'll basically sound uh, like you know, someone who has a type of schizophrenia. You know, uh, where you won't make any sense. So that's, uh, that's Wernicke's area, okay? It's involved in speech comprehension. And then we also have the occipital lobe at the, the back of the brain. I'll show you an image in a moment. The only thing I need you to know about the occipital lobe is it contains the primary visual cortex. It's the main part of the brain that understands vision. It understands what you're looking at. It allows you to recognize things like faces and shapes and objects. 
It, it allows you to understand if something's moving toward you or away from you. If something is horizontal or vertical at an angle, allows you to understand color, shape and size and lots of different things. All these things that we take for granted, we look at something and instantly we know so much about that thing that we're looking at. That's because of the primary visual cortex. It allows you to understand what you're looking at. Let's keep going. That was the cerebral cortex. Okay. Now here's an image of the brain so you can, uh, you know, look at where these things are contained. So we started with the frontal lobe. Now the frontal lobe is that area in blue. So the part that's in blue, it's like that front half of the brain almost, almost the entire front half of the brain that you can see the entire front wrinkled part of the brain, the surface. Okay. So that area in blue there, the, you know, the light blue, the little bit darker blue, but that whatever that's area in blue, that's the frontal cortex. It's like the whole front half. Okay. Like if you take your, your hand and you cover your forehead with it extends toward the top of your head, that's kind of your frontal lobe. And we mentioned it contains the prefrontal cortex, which is involved with, you know, self-control allows you to control your emotions, control your movements. I mean, not movements to control yourself, basically control your emotions. Okay. To decide what you're going to do allows, it allows you to basically understand, for instance, that you are alive and breathing and that, and those kind of things. Uh, it, it determines what you're going to focus on. That's the prefrontal cortex, like the executive part of the brain. And there's the motor cortex. The motor cortex is like that ribbon uh, that runs like almost halfway um, up the brain, like uh, the, the end there of the, of the frontal lobe. There is that stripe that goes down. That's the part of your brain that controls movement. And inter interestingly enough, different parts of that ribbon there control different parts of the body. So there's a little section for your hands you know, for your face, for your tongue, for your lips, your, your, your legs, your toes, all those different things. They're on there like nations on a map. And then we have uh, Broca's area, which is uh, below that, that circular area there. Broca's area allows you to basically produce speech, move your lips and your vocal cords and your jaw and your tongue in a co coordinated way to produce speech. Uh, if you think about it, that is also movement but it's movement that's related to speech. So it's right there. You could say it, you could say it's, uh, you know, it's right next to the primary motor cortex because it's also movement, um, but it's movement that involves speech. Um, and then we have the primary somatosensory cortex, that area that's, uh, that's more like red, you know, the uh, couple of shades of red there. Uh, that has a stripe there um, that's right next to the motor cortex. Uh, that uh, is called the primary somatosensory cortex. That's the part of the brain that allows you to understand touch. And in interestingly enough, just like the primary motor, primary motor cortex, there are different areas of that uh, somatosensory cortex for different parts of your body. So there's an area for your face, for your hands, for your back, you know, uh, for your, even your general areas, uh, your toes, your legs, all these different parts, like nations on a map. So when somebody, let's say, uh, touches your face, that information gets sent to the primary somatosensory cortex to a certain part of that somatosensory cortex. Okay, that is all I need you to know about the primary somatosensory cortex is that it involves touch and different parts of your body are represented on different parts of the somatosensory cortex. Um, and no, uh, something else I wanna tell you guys, notice that the primary somatosensory cortex and the motor cortex um, are next to each other. That's because movement and touch uh, go actually together. Like when you touch something and it's really hot, you understand that it's hot because of the primary somatosensory cortex. But then the primary motor cortex, but then your brain also makes a decision, you know, at the primary motor cortex that you should move your hand away from that thing that is hot. So movement and touch go together. But they're represented in different parts of the brain. Um, and then uh, we have the temporal lobe, which is on the side over here. Two things I need you to know about that is that it contains the primary auditory cortex that allows you to understand, you know, basically sounds and Wernicke's area that allows you to understand um, speech sounds or allows you to understand language. It's sound either way, but there's a specific part for speech that allows you to understand speech sounds, allows you to understand what you're saying, what other people are saying. That's Wernicke's area. And then the auditory cortex is other sounds. 
And then we have the back, we have the occipital lobe. All I need to know about that, like I said, is it contains the primary visual cortex, which allows you to understand the things that you're looking at. What shape it is, what it is, what color it is, whether it's moving toward you, away from you, or it's not moving at all. Uh, things like that allows you to recognize faces, a lot of different things happening there that all have to do with vision. And by the way, you know, the er different areas of the brain, they work together. We're talking about them as if they're isolated, but they work together. The brain is kind of communicating with other parts of the brain and the body, uh, you know, all the time. Okay, that was the cerebral cortex. Now we need to talk about other parts of the forebrain. The cerebral cortex is the part that you can see that is wrinkled, okay? And we broke that into, up into four lobes that were further broken into different brain areas and we talked about the function. But there's, another part of the, there's other parts of the forebrain that you can't really see as you go inside the brain, you know, beyond the surface, deeper into the brain, you will encounter some of these things like the limbic system. So we're gonna talk about B, C, and D, okay? Three other regions. So the limbic system contains several different brain areas and we're not gonna mention all of them. It contains about maybe seven different brain areas. We're only gonna mention four. Okay, the limbic system basically contains the amygdala, which is involved with aggression and fear. So for instance, let's say you, uh, you're out there, let's say taking a hike and you see a bear and you get scared. Okay, that's because of the amygdala. And should the bear attack you or try to attack you, you would also become aggressive. That's also because of the amygdala. Aggression and fear go together. Aggression and fear are very important for survival. And that is the job of the amygdala, uh, basically to control those things or, you know, or to basically you know, to deal with those things. Um, think about a stray cat, right? If you encounter a stray cat, let's say you, you co corner a stray cat and it has nowhere to go. That cat won't just be afraid of you. It will also be aggressive. If you try to touch it, it's going to scratch you and bite you. That is the amygdala response for that. If, by the way, if you destroy the amygdala, then that stray cat will no longer be afraid of you, will no longer try to bite and scratch you. But it's a very important part of the brain. It's very important for survival. It's very important for the fight or flight response. The amygdala is part of the fight or flight response, which we'll talk about later. The septo area is involved with pleasure. And that's all I'm going to say about that, um, because when it comes to feeling good and feeling a sense of reward and things like that that can lead to addiction, uh, the main job of that is the nucleus accumbens, okay? But the septa is just involved with pleasure, just know that, but I'm not going to say much more about it. But I'm going to say a little bit more about the nucleus accumbens. The nucleus accumbens is a part of the brain that is involved with reward and addiction. You know, when you accomplish something, you, you do something, you achieve something, and you feel good, you have that sense of reward, that's the nucleus accumbens. And I mentioned before that uh, it's, you know, uh, something about dopamine, that dopamine makes you feel good and gives you that sense of reward. Well, dopamine is having an effect at the nucleus accumbens, okay? Nucleus accumbens is also involved with addiction because when you do something that feels good and then you want to do it again and then do it again and again, and eventually you get hooked, you get addicted and you keep wanting to do the same thing, uh, that is also because of the nucleus accumbens. And remember, it also involves dopamine. Dopamine makes you feel good and it makes you want to do something again and again. Like when you're playing a video game and you pass a certain level and you get rewarded with coins, right? And you get to buy things with, your, with those coins, you feel good. So then you go try to go on to the next level, right? You know, to, to earn that reward again. And like I said, each time you earn that reward, uh, you get a burst of dopamine and you feel good. And the more you do that, you know, the more likely you are to get addicted because it's rewarding you and you feel good every time and therefore you want to keep feeling good. So you keep trying to do the same thing. You can become addicted, by the way, to many different things, not just video games. It could also be sex, could be alcohol, could be smoking, could be shopping. You know, you could be addicted to exercise, many different things. Things that make you feel good can become addicting. If you do them over and over and over again, you know, there's stimulation occurring at the nucleus accumbens and uh, you can become addicted and you keep seeking the same reward so that you can feel good again. The hippocampus is another part of the limbic system. It's involved with learning and memory. Um, easy way to remember the hippocampus, just think of a smart hippo going to campus, right? Taking college classes, that's a smart hippo. He wants to learn and learning also involves memory. Um, learning and memory are, are, um, are related. Um, 
if you want to remember things, by the way, and there'll be a chapter on memory, if you want to remember things, it's best that you learn it. When you learn something, you understand how it works. And when you learn something, you don't really have to memorize anything. Because as you're learning things, you are applying the information, you're connecting it in memory. And then rather than trying to remember everything, you remember your examples or you remember how it works. And then that helps you kind of just understand, you know, what it is. Okay. Um, that's the way. learning basically and memory go together. Okay. If you just remember what things are, that's, you know, that's just memory. But if you understand how things work, that is learning. And when you understand how things work, you're going to remember what they are. So it's best that you learn and you understand, you pay attention and apply this to your own life. You know, uh, just think of other applications. Think of, you need to try to connect it in memory. But the hippocampus is involved in both of those things, learning and memory. And the hippocampus is not the only thing involved with learning and memory, by the way. There's other things involved with learning and memory. But the hippocampus helps get things into memory. So without the hippocampus, you can't really learn anything new. But you can still remember other things that are stored in different parts of the brain. Um, so it helps you learn. It helps you get things into memory. Okay. There's other parts of the limbic system we're not going to mention. Okay. But this is enough. But if you look at it as a whole, the limbic system is involved with three things. Emotion learning and memory. Learning and memory is really the, hip, the job of the hippocampus. And then the other things have to do with emotion and motivation. So things like reward and fear and aggression, pleasure, that's all emotion. Let's keep going. We also need to talk about the thalamus and hypothalamus. Okay, the thalamus, um, the thalamus doesn't seem to be that interesting. But the thalamus seems to do uh, have a very important job, but it just doesn't seem to be that interesting. The thalamus receives information from the senses and it sends it to the area of the cortex where it, where it needs to be processed. So let's say if you touch something, the information travels, let's say from your hand where you're touching something, you know, uh, up your arm, spinal cord, up to the brain, eventually encounters the thalamus and the thalamus basically says, oh, your information about touch, you need to go to the somatosensory cortex and it sends it there. So it's like a routing center. It sends the information where it needs to go. That's what the thalamus does. It doesn't seem to be that special, but you need to know what the thalamus is and what it does. The hypothalamus is a little bit more interesting. It doesn't seem the, the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus regulates motivation and emotion, okay? So it's involved with the fight or flight response, for instance, fighting, fleeing. Remember how I said that the, the amygdala uh, basically is involved with aggression and fear? Well, the hypothalamus is basically what triggers the fight or flight response. You see a bear, right? You become fearful and aggressive because of the amygdala. The hypothalamus is the part of the brain that sends the signal to the amygdala, hey, something's happening here, you need to respond, okay? Uh, it communicates also with other parts of the brain because it's involved with the fight or flight response. You know, it, it allows you to recognize something, right? Uh, it, it communicates with the part of the brain with the visual cortex, allows you to recognize that it's a bear, that it's something you should be afraid of, and that triggers the fight or flight response from the amygdala. So the hypothalamus is involved with fighting and fleeing, fight or flight response, but it's also involved with feeding and sex. And we'll actually talk about uh, other areas of the hypothalamus when we get to the chapter on motivation. There'll be a section on, on sex, and there'll also be uh, a section that has to do with eating. And the hypothalamus is involved with those things as well. So the hypothalamus, a way to remember that, it's kind of a little bit of a, of a joke uh, that I learned it from my professor when I went to college. Now I'm sharing it with you guys. The hypothalamus is said to be involved with what we call the four Fs. The four Fs, okay? Fighting, fleeing, feeding, and sexual behavior. But you have to think of another word for, for sex. And it doesn't have to be the F word, by the way. If you are not married, it's called fornication. Okay, but that's the hypothalamus. It's involved with the four Fs. It triggers the fight or flight response. Okay, and if, in doing so, it will communicate with the amygdala and other parts of the brain and the body to respond to emergencies. But we'll talk about that later. Okay, let's keep going. I know that we had a little bit of a disruption there, but hopefully you understood what I was talking about. The midbrain, the midbrain, I'm not going to say much about. It's just one slide and these five different brain areas. Uh, the midbrain contains the periaqueductal gray, which is involved with pain. 
It's actually in the spinal cord, okay? Uh, the red nucleus, um, you know, is involved with movement, and so is the substantia nigra. And some of those have been implicated, like in Parkinson's. If that's damaged, then you'll get kind of jerky movements, like those that have Parkinson's. The superior colliculi is involved with visual reflexes, like the ability for you to move your eyes, you know, uh, left or right or up and down, and uh, you know things like that. And, and then your pupil is getting bigger and smaller, right? And the inferior colliculi is involved with hearing. You know, the fact that you, you hear a sound and you can localize the sound, you know which direction it's coming from, that's because of the inferior colliculi. That's the midbrain. I'm not gonna say much more about it. It's not that interesting. And to tell you the truth, I'm not really gonna ask you about it, okay? Other than the fact that it's part of the forebrain. So I don't really like to talk too much about the midbrain. It doesn't seem to be that interesting. But let's talk about uh, another part of the brain called the hindbrain. Okay, the hindbrain. So the area, so the back of the brain, it's really the, the part of, of the brain um, that um, connects, um, you know, like with your spinal cord, okay? Uh, that's the hindbrain. And it has different areas that I need you to know about, different parts. It has a few more parts than this, but this is enough uh, for you guys. So it contains the cerebellum, um, which is involved with skilled movement. So here we have another part of the brain that is also involved with movement, but the cerebellum's job is to make the movement more skilled. Believe it or not, it's involved with standing. When you are standing, believe it or not, that is skilled movement. The brain is communicating you know, with the rest of the body and the body with the brain very quickly and rapidly, okay? And it's actually, it, you know, as you can see, most animals can't stand, um, can't stand on their, on, on their hand. They can't stand, basically, okay? The cerebellum is involved in, in that. Okay, uh, typing, playing the piano, uh, dancing, painting, you know, doing sculptures, all that is skilled movement or playing basketball, you know, things like that. All that involves the cerebellum. So it makes movement more skilled. If you damage the cerebellum, you can still walk, you can still type and play the piano and play basketball. The thing is, you won't be very good at it because movement will not be very skilled. So the cerebellum is involved with refining movement, with making it more skilled. That's the cerebellum. Uh, and there's a way to remember that. Uh, the way I remember that is, see, there's the word bell in there. Bell means beautiful. So I think of beautiful movement, and then I think of a ballerina dancing or someone playing beautiful music on the piano. That's what the cerebellum's involved with. And cera just means brain. So it's... It's really the part of the brain that's involved with skilled movement or beautiful movement, you could, if you want to think of it that way. It's not always beautiful, but it's skilled movement. Uh, the pawns are involved with attention, sleep, alertness, respiration. Um, the pawns uh, and other areas of the brain are, are actually uh, responsible for keeping you awake. So it helps you maintain attention, stay focused, right? It decreases uh, sleepiness. It makes you more alert and increases heart rate and breathing, okay? That's the pons. It's actually involved in keeping you awake. If the pons are less active, then you get more sleepy. And then your breathing rate goes down. Attention, well, you start to lose it, okay? So that's the pons. And the way to remember the pons is, well, think of something that is very close to that, like palms, like, like cheerleaders use this thing called pom-poms, right, pom-poms, right? And the job of the cheerleader is to basically keep you guys excited during the game. So they have their cheers and all that stuff. You know, well, think of the cheerleaders now, like they're trying to keep you awake, trying to keep you excited, trying to keep you alert. The pawns are doing something similar. So that's the way to remember that. The reticular activating system, the RAS, it's also called the reticular formation. It's also involved with attention, sleep, and arousal. It also helps keep you awake. When it is less active, you are more sleepy, less awake, less aroused, okay? Uh, that is the reticular activating system or the reticular formation. And you'll see when I show you the image that those two parts of the brain are very close to each other. And then we have the medulla. The medulla controls uh, heart rate, blood pressure, and breathing. It controls those things, like your vital signs, basically. If you damage the medulla, you're gonna go into a coma and potentially die. Actually, the medulla, if you damage the medulla, you could, you could just die, okay? Um, 
I misspoke there. If you damage the pond, the reticular activating system, and other parts of the brain that actually have to do with sleeping and waking, if you damage those parts, then you can go into a coma that you may never wake from. Or maybe you will wake from it, but you know, that's the hindbrain. It's that part of the brain that connects to the spinal cord. And it's involved with some very important things. The pond's reticular formation and other parts of the brain are involved with basically keeping you awake or helping you fall asleep. And the medulla basically controls those vital signs, right? Heart rate, blood pressure, breathing. And it's easy to remember medulla because if you just think of med, right, medicine, you go to the doctor and you have that nurse that checks your vitals, right? That's what the medulla does. It controls those things. Let's look at an image so we can understand a little bit. Uh, an image here. Um, so there's the hindbrain there. Um, you can see it's that part, the bottom part of the brain, the back where it connects with the spinal cord. And here it is greatly enlarged. And you can see there it's showing you the pons and the pons there kind of looks like a pompon to some extent. The reticular formation, those things that look like teeth that go through the pons, it's part of the whole same system. That thing is known as like the brain stem and includes other parts too. And the brain stem is basically responsible for keeping you awake and helping you go to sleep. Some parts of the brain that I didn't mention that are part of this system, uh, when you activate them, when you make them more active, they make you sleepy. And other, other parts of the brain, like the pons and reticular formation, when you activate those parts of the brain, when you make them more active, they help you stay awake. So it's the opposite. When they're less active, then you're more sleepy. And the cerebellum is that thing right there. Um, you know, uh, it look, kind of looks like a little bit like a shrimp or something like that. Uh, that is the part of the brain that controls skilled movement. So playing the piano, you know, walking and standing and, you know, and uh, dancing and things like that. Uh, the cerebellum helps that make that movement more skilled. Uh, and then the medulla, that little bump there below the cerebellum, uh, that uh, controls your vitals, your heart rate, blood pressure, breathing. And then that connects with the spinal cord. And uh, I mentioned before that if you, you know, you break your neck, if you're lucky, you end up paralyzed, but you could very easily die. And the reason for that is because, you know, your neck connects basically to these areas over here, to the hindbrain. And if you damage the hindbrain, you can very easily die because it controls those things that help keep you alive, help keep you breathing, okay? Controls heart rate, blood pressure, breathing, right? Uh, and also things that have to do with sleeping and waking damage those and you might just go into a coma and lose consciousness and stay in that coma and never wake from it. And then later on, they'll probably pull the plug on you. Or if you're lucky, they might be able to, um, you know, to revive you. Um, interestingly enough, they found out by accident, and it doesn't always work, but they found out by accident that sometimes when people are in a coma, um, if they're given sleep medication, which is supposed to help them sleep, Sometimes it actually helps wake them from the coma and the people will actually awake. So the sleep medications are to some extent working on this part of the brain. And sometimes they may actually do the opposite and help the person wake up from that coma. It's happened in some instances uh, like that, but it doesn't always work. Um, but there's some very interesting things about sleep. Okay, sleep is involved with you know, being alive and being awake and being conscious. And that's the part of the brain that's involved with that. Let's keep going. That was all the central nervous system. Now we need to talk about the peripheral nervous system. And, we, and this is, we're gonna go through this uh, faster, okay? Um, the peripheral nervous system, okay? Um, it's just not, it, I mean, we're done with the brain. Now we're gonna talk about the, from the spinal cord to the other parts of the body. So there's not as much to talk about as there is for the brain, believe it or not. So the peripheral nervous system can be divided, and I've said this before, I showed you a bigger flow chart. Um, it, uh, it contains the autonomic and somatic nervous system. Remember the autonomic nervous system? Uh, it says here it controls self-regulated action, the self-regulated action of the uh, internal organs and glands. I'll explain what that means in a moment. And then somatic, somatic nervous system controls voluntary movements of skeletal muscles. Somatic nervous system really has to do with movement and the brain communicating with the body and body back with the brain, uh, that kind of stuff. We can further break down the autonomic nervous system into the sympathetic uh, nervous system, which is arousing, which responds to emergencies, and the parasympathetic nervous system, which is calming, you know, which happens, which uh, functions during non-emergencies. But let's say this uh, in a little bit of a different way. Here's uh, information for you guys about the peripheral nervous system. So it contains the somatic nervous system. So what does the somatic nervous system do? I'll talk about that one first, and then we'll just 
leave it behind and just talk more about the autonomic nervous system, which is more interesting. The somatic nervous system transmits signals from the five senses to the central nervous system, so up the spinal cord to the brain, and then from the central nervous system, from your brain, right, to the muscles so that you can control purposeful body movement. So the somatic nervous system is basically involved with voluntary movement, things that you do, uh, movements that you do that you control, like raising your hand, for instance, that involves the somatic nervous system. Signals being sent to the brain and then back down that involve movement, that whole thing is called the somatic nervous system. Okay, not that interesting, I understand, but let's talk more about the autonomic nervous system. It's a little bit more interesting and I'll have to explain this. So hopefully you're paying attention. The autonomic nervous system transmits information between the central nervous system, it says, and the internal organs such as the glands, heart, circulatory system. Let me explain that, okay? The autonomic nervous system is involved with things that most of the time function automatically. The function of your glands, heart, your circulatory system, respiratory system, it's involved with all those things. Let me explain how this works and what is actually happening with the autonomic nervous system. The autonomic nervous system, you understand this better if you just think about its two main divisions and what they do. The autonomic nervous system can be divided into the sympathetic division and the parasympathetic division. It's also called the sympathetic nervous system or the parasympathetic nervous system. Same thing. Okay, when you see the word sympathetic division or nervous system, that's the same thing. Okay, um, the sympathetic nervous system or the sympathetic division of the autonomic nervous system is what activates the fight or flight response during an emergency. So what happens during an emergency, during the fight or flight response, right? Well, your heart races, your heart beats a lot faster. You breathe faster, your pupils dilate, right? Digestion stops. You, may actually, uh, you might actually pee your pants if you get really scared or poop yourself. But either way, what happens is you lose control of digestion if you get really scared. So your heart races pump more blood throughout the body so you can run faster, hit harder, right? You can breathe faster. It's all, so there's a whole bunch of things that happen during the fight or flight response. And I'm just telling you here about some things, but the fight or flight response, fight or, the fight or flight response, you know, doesn't just involve these things happening in the body, but it involves things happening in the brain. I mentioned the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus is what triggers the fight or flight response. So the hypothalamus is part of the sympathetic division. It also involves the amygdala, okay? It involves your adrenal glands, organs of the body that have to function uh, you know, more vigorously during an emergency, during the fight or flight response. Like if you see a bear, for instance, you, know, you get scared, you recognize the bear as something to be feared, your fight or flight response is triggered. That involves the hypothalamus, the amygdala, you know, you breathe faster, right? Heart races, your pupils get larger to let in more light. You may pee your pants, but you're ready to run away or fight for survival if you need to. That is what the sympathetic division is involved with. During emergencies, it's, it's, it's the fight or flight response. And it actually involves a whole bunch of different brain areas and a whole bunch of different organs and parts of the body. That whole system is called the sympathetic division of the nervous system. The, the parasympathetic division actually does the opposite. It opposes the sympathetic division. It calms you down. Its job is to help you keep calm, to relax you. So it will reduce your heart rate, your breathing, constrict the pupils, will start digestion after the emergency. Okay? That's the way you need to function most of the time. You can't function like it's an emergency all the time or you'll wear yourself out. You know, you're gonna get a heart attack and die. Okay, uh, but the parasympathetic division calms you down, you know, gets the heart, you know, you know, uh, beating at a normal rate, breathing at a normal rate, right? Uh, you know, you regain control of digestion, things function more normally at a slower rate. That's what the parasympathetic division does. It is what operates most of the time, you know, to keep you calm and keep you functioning normally. Because when it's an emergency, the sympathetic division kicks in, and that is not a normal time. That is not a normal response. It kicks in things into high gear so that you can run away or fight for your life if you need to. So that's the sympathetic and parasympathetic division. And here is an image for you. 
Well, okay, so here's the thing. I'll remind you guys, the sympathetic nervous system arouses, so it's involved with the fight or flight response, and the parasympathetic uh, division uh, calms, basically. It's involved with rest uh, and uh, digestion. And here you can see different uh, parts of the brain, uh, actually not so many parts of the brain, but different parts of the body that are involved. So the sympathetic nervous system will dilate your pupils, get your heart going faster. It, it you know, inhibits digestion, it's involved with the stomach, right? Uh, involved with your liver because it stimulates glucose that is needed for energy. Your adrenal glands are involved because you know, uh, it releases more adrenaline so you can run faster, hit harder, right? Um, and, and also, you know, stimulate secretion of epinephrine, norepinephrine, basically that's adrenaline. Adrenaline in the brain is norepinephrine. Adrenaline in the body is epinephrine. Relaxes the gallbladder. So you pee your pants and stimulates ejaculation in the male. That is something interesting there. During an emergency, you know what happens during an emergency, okay? Uh, sexually, you can't really function during an emergency. So let's say you're uh, gonna have sex with somebody and there you are, you're both naked, and you're nervous, you're scared. You know, it's, it's like the fight or flight response. There you are, you're breathing kind of faster, you're anxious, you're nervous. And what happens, especially if you're a male and you wanna have sex and you're nervous, anxious, you know, basically the fight or flight response is kind of operating there, kind of at a lower level, but it's operating. Uh, what happens is you can't maintain an erection. And what happens is that when you do try to have sex, it's over right away you have premature ejaculation. What you need to do if you want sex to last longer, be more enjoyable, is you need to calm down. So the parasympathetic nervous system has to take over and calm you down. So it will constrict the pupils, right? Not as much light needed, um, you know, not as much information, right? Um, but it will slow down your heartbeat, digestion will function normally, and so will the, you know, the liver and the gallbladder, right? The, the bladder will contract, meaning that you're not going to pee your pants. You'll be able to, you know, to tighten up there and, you know, keep yourself from peeing and allows blood flow to the sex organs. So it will basically allow you to maintain an erection if you're a male because it's all blood flow and then function normally. So when you want, when you're going to have sex, especially if you're a male, if you want things to work out sexually, if you want to be able to perform, you need to relax. Otherwise, sex will be over right away. You might not be able to get it up. And if you do get it up, you're, you're going to ejaculate right away. You're not going to last very long. Okay. Because you need to relax, you know, during sex. So an important lesson there. Um, there's a, a link there to a video that I'm not going to try to play because I have tried to play videos in my other classes, even with the laptop and people complain they can't hear it or it's too low. And I don't know why, but it has probably has something to do with Zoom. So I'll let you guys watch the videos on your own if you're interested. And here are references, the uh, things that we've been citing, right? This is the way they are referenced. So I'm, I'm showing you things here and there about APA style. So that when we actually do talk about APA style, it will be easier for you guys to understand. Okay.